Hello there, sword friends. This is going to be a review on a Cold Steel Emperor series katana, and this review is a little different than what I normally do. It will include all of the long-winded rambling that is often included in my reviews, but it's divided into two separate distinct parts, basically because I have two separate distinct swords that I'm reviewing in one review. Before I go too far into this video, there are a couple things that you need to note that are important before you consider my opinion on anything. Uh, first and foremost, I will admit to having a negative bias towards Cold Steel before starting this review, right? Before you hear my thoughts, know that I'm not a fan of Cold Steel. I'm not a, a total hater of their products either, but I am not a fan, and you should know that going in. I will include some information in the description below, and I'll include some stuff at the end of the video, but I'm not going to ramble about it too much now, though I'm just going to admit to it up front, and you should know that before hearing anything I have to say. The second thing that you should note that you might think skews my opinion is that Cold Steel sent me a better product back than what I sent them. I bought a product secondhand, they had no legal reason to warranty it, they weren't under any obligation, and they sent me a better product back than what I sent them. You might think that that sways my opinion a bit. I do find it very pleasant in terms of customer service wise, but just know those two are factors going into this review. We'll take a look at the Cold Steel website to start off, and you can see that the sword is described here, and it retails for $879.99, so pretty close to $900. Also, I note that the pictures on the website don't really give the kind of brassy, goldish look that the silver has. It looks a lot more silver on the website photos than it does in person. Also, you can buy it from Cult of Athena for $449.95. That's a pretty significant discount, and Cult of Athena is a trusted dealer, so I don't know why you would buy it for close to $900 on Cold Steel's website. You can also buy it from Amazon. I've heard in some of the Amazon reviews and reading them that some of the... Some of the swords may be second-hand, or not second-hand, but factory seconds and not have a warranty, or some people have had warranty issues dealing with the purchases from Amazon. That's just some bits that I read, and there's some funny things to read there. But anyway, Amazon even has them. These are a couple quick measurements and specifications for the blade. A couple things to note, it's supposed to be made out of 1055 or 1060 high carbon steel, though I can't exactly tell you which one. One website says 1060, one says 1055, but either way it's made out of steel. The measurements are 11 inches for mine, 11.25 inches is what's advertised, so mine's a little shorter. The blade length I measured it at 28.5 inches, the websites all say 29.5 inches, but fair enough, I, my measurement does not include the habaki as my understanding is that the blade length on Japanese swords is not supposed to be measured from the tip to the cross guard, it's supposed to be measured from the tip to where the habaki begins. That would account for the missing inch, but I can't find any website that specifies where the measurements are exactly taking place, but my 28.5 is measured from the very tip to the base of the habaki, so basically not including the habaki. The sori or the curvature of the blade again is measured from that same distance tip to base of the habaki and it comes out at three quarters of an inch. Couldn't find a measurement that specified what the sori length was. Now my measurements of measurements of thickness are the moto habasaki haba, that's the width of the blade. You can see that it tapers from about uh, an inch and a quarter to just under an inch from the, the width of the blade. The thickness of the blade, the moto kisane, saki kisane are also again measured from that where the habaki base starts, uh, so just above the habaki to where the kasaki starts, and you can see there is a slight distal taper there. The cold steel only includes in, in measurement for thickness at 0.28 inches, or they measure it at 9.30 seconds, with about 0.28 inches, but I'm not sure exactly where on the blade that was taken. Now weight is something surprising, because this blade feels like a tank in your hand, and I measure it at two, pound, two pounds, eight ounces. It's supposed to be two pounds, nine and a half ounces, roughly, but uh, basically they're pretty pretty on the nose when it comes to the measurement, off by about an ounce and a half. But it feels like it should be a lot heavier. Point of balance, Cult of Athena advertises at 10 inches, but I don't know where that's from. My 5.5 inches is measured from the suka or from the cross guard. If I talk about the overall look or just general aesthetics of the sword, I have to admit that I like it. I like Cold Steel's take on swords and at least how they look. They have a kind of American minimalist type interpretation to them and I maybe as an American minimalist type guy, like like the way that looks. I will say that the Emperor series is not my favorite of the warrior, dragonfly, and now Emperor that I've handled, but I do have to admit that I, I like the overall theme. I like that it has a metal kojiri that's the little metal piece at the end of the saya. I like the casting quality. The silver on this one just looks a little campy to me, having all silver fittings without any kind of patina on them is a little bit of a distraction. It, it makes my eye jump right to those fittings. Again, you may like it or not like it. These are very subjective things that I'm talking about. So if you think something different, more power to you if you like it. Though I do admit that it seems to be a reasonably good looking sword. 
Now, saying that the fittings are an eyesore isn't exactly fair. What I mean is I don't like it personally when my eyes are inherently drawn to one part of the katana and not seeing the katana as one whole piece. I, I don't like it when I can instinctually fixate on one thing, and these fittings do that a bit. What I will say about the fittings, though, if we look a little closer at the Kojiri or that little end metal cap, is that they're cast really well. Now, keep in mind these aren't perfectly fitted. You can see there's a little bit of a ledge where the Kojiri meets the Saya, and that shouldn't be there. It should be flush, there shouldn't be a transition. But when I speak specifically about the Kojiri, what I see is that it's reasonably well cast. And this will follow with all of the rest of the fittings. Cast fittings have some kind of preconceived notions, at least on my part that they get muddied and ugly and dull and lack detail, especially when you do thousands and thousands of the same cast. A lot of times they end up losing a lot of the detail, but I can still make out lines in the waves, I can still make out what's supposed to be those little Nanako bumps underneath, and I can just tell that this is a, a tsunami theme. I can see what they're trying to do with it, and I appreciate that. The casting is, is pretty well done. Also, note that the fittings have this kind of goldish silver look almost. The website earlier showed them as a very stark silvery color and these have a, a different kind of goldish look to them. It's still silver but it has a little bit of yellow in it. A couple of additional details about the Saya. You can note that there is a Kurigata here and the Kurigata is the little hoop area that the Sageo is tied through. That's that cord thing. The thing I will say about it is that it has some Shittadome in it which are those metal washers. A lot of times these are made out of brass, but this is made out of the same type of silverish substance that the rest of the sword is made out of. And the attention to keeping things the same and not cheaping out and using basic brass ones is, is appreciated and noted here. I'll also note that this is my second hand piece and that the Kurigata is very often cracked in shipping and I don't see any cracks or any deformations or anything bad about this one. Another detail on the Saya that you can make out because my second hand piece has a paint chip in it or a chip in the lacquer, the horn portion of the Koiguchi, the Koiguchi is the mouth of the Saya where the blade is put back into the scabbard, you can see that it's got a horn portion on it. Now that's very conventional, it's expected to be a horn portion, but the lacquer on the cold steel is such that you can't really make out the detail in the horn as well as you could on say some other production swords out there. But this paint chip clearly indicates that there is in fact a horn portion there. So it's there. Hooray. And talking about the Suba, there's a couple pieces that I like and a couple that I don't. I like that you can make out very detailed bits on the casting as well. The Suba is no exception to the casting quality. There's a lot of detail in it. I like that you can also see some contrast in the Sepa. The Sepa are the little washers that go between the handle and the blade collar around the cross guard or the Suba area. They offer a little bit of contrast, which I think is nice. What I don't necessarily like about this area on the sword is that the rim of the, the Suba is just kind of a mirror finish. And I would like it if it had a little bit more detail in some of the intricate casting details wrapped around the Suba. I think it would add a little bit of depth. In addition, the Habaki has a similar color to the rest of the fittings, but it's a very plain Jane, kind of the same type of Habaki you see on just about everything. It'd be nice if there were some additional details. It doesn't have to be as detailed as everything else, but something to make it stand apart from every other sword out there, aside from just it being a slightly silverish color. Now we're going to talk about the handle, the ska, the suka, if you will, and the things I'm going to note most specifically about this one is that this is in specific reference to the second hand blade that I have. I will talk about the suka on the newer one Cold Steel sent me a little bit later in the video. What I'm going to note about this one though is that the shape overall is pleasant. I like it. It's not too big. It's not too axe-like. It's not too small either or flimsy. But what I am going to note is that the Ito is loose. The diamonds are misshapen. I can make out the edge of the panels. I can uh, move the Ito around. One of the Manuki looks a little lackluster. It doesn't have the same casting quality as the rest of the sword does. And those are all things that I find very uh, bad, or at least not great. The loose Ito doesn't appear to be, be as a result of handling. The sword doesn't look like it was used a whole lot. But the Ito is, is loose, and that's, that's one thing that is not so great. The other positives though, I like the transition between the Fuchi and the Saya. It's not jarring, it's not enormous, and that part I think they did reasonably well on sizing. Additionally, the casting quality, with the exception of the one Minuki, the Fuchi and the Kashra all have the same detail that you saw in the Kuroji and the, in the Suba. They, they have a very nice casting quality, they're of the same color, and that portion is nice. The other detail that I want to note about this specific Suka though, is maybe highlighted in, in some of the video I took while I was trying to take it off. So take a look at that. I don't know what the shit is going on with this cold steel sword. 
but I am trying to take this off and it is being a real bear. It looks like there is some paper of some kind wrapped around the tang. You can kind of see it in the Makugi Ana. Kind of bunched up down here. Doting Daughter is jamming out a Mario Kart and I wish I could join her, but this darn Suka won't come off. Not cool, guys. Not cool. Now I'm showing this up against the handle before I took it off, just so that you can see the contrast, because it doesn't look like it was ever removed. I had to darn near destroy the Makugi pegs to get the thing off. It was a real bear to take off, and you can see that it's been taken off now that I've done it. The thing I want to keep this in mind for is that I think it came this way from the factory. I have to admit that this is a secondhand sword and that is speculative on my part. It could have come that way from the person that bought it from me and not from the factory, but I, I think it came that way from the factory. And I understand why. Maybe the skull was loose and they wrapped some paper around it to tighten it up so that it fit really well. The downside is it should fit really well without the paper wrapped around it and that made it a bear to take apart, which would make it very very difficult for the average person to take apart and clean if, if you were going to use it for sword purposes which frankly is its intention right moving on to the pokey pokey stabby part of the part that most of you are actually interested in the blade and what i can tell you about this blade from an aesthetic and overall look perspective is there's really not a lot to say about it i'll touch on how it feels in just a second but the point i'd make is the aesthetic qualities of this blade are really basic. It's got a polished bohe, which you don't necessarily see on some of the other cold steel models. The rest of the polish is kind of the workhorse 800 grit type polish, which makes you not afraid to cut with it because you can fix it with basic sandpaper, but it lacks any kind of banding or artistic quality that you might expect to see in Japanese swords. That's not really the point of this one though, so if that's what you're expecting, you're going to want to look at something else. The other thing to note is that the Kasaki is an artistic embellishment as well. It's not really geometrically there, it's just burnished or wire brushed on, but it provides some sort of contrast between at least the tip and it's one nice little thing to look at. So it's not completely bare bones, aesthetically blank of any characteristics. There's the polish in the bohi, there's the Kasaki that's brushed on, but other than that, it's just it's a workhorse blade and that's for, for what it is it looks nice. The other thing that I'll note is that the flats on the blade aren't bad. You can see that they're overall pretty well and clear. There's some ripples and some stuff along the bohe, but for what it is, it's reasonably well crafted. Another important thing I want to note again about this second hand piece before I go into the testing and feel portion of the blade is look at this damage to the edge. This came this way, it was a little one millimeter nick, but one thing that I didn't notice in looking at this footage uh, that I should have before testing is that you can see that the edge is about a half a millimeter thick and flat. It's not, it's not sharp, it doesn't come to a fine point. It's tough to see in the video, but it is there. Take a look at it because it's an important consideration going into what you're going to see next. Now, bear in mind as you watch this footage that you know about the dullness of the edge and the fact that it's dull like in Iaito, but I don't at this point. I just broke out some water bottles while I was testing swords. I'd never looked at the edge really. I, I saw that it was damaged and whatnot, but I didn't realize in fact that it was very, very dull and well, just not, not sharp at all. So my kind of dumb, depressed face here is thinking, what the hell is going on? What am I doing wrong? And it's not until this water bottle flying across the floor when it should be cut by just about anything does it make me actually look at the edge. And so this face that you see is me going, why didn't I see this earlier? God, God damn, this thing is dull as hell. What, what's the deal? How did I not see this? I feel slightly vindicated about my cutting, of course, because I'm smacking it with a bludgeoning instrument as opposed to a sharpened edge. But nevertheless, I feel kind of silly for not having noticed this earlier. You can see it's dull enough for me to kind of drape my fingers across and not get cut, and it's, it's not really acceptably sharp. So I decide to do some more cutting with it, obviously, because that's the right choice to make, right? So I move on to Tatami. The thing I'm going to note is that I start with some basic cuts that were working on other swords. I also tested it alongside a sky jewel blade that was cutting through things, but it's not really fair to compare because this one is dull. I did try swinging harder and it got some penetration, but not a lot. Anyway, it was dull as shit. Something pretty interesting happened when I was going through the process of doing this review, and that really interesting thing is that the sword didn't perform well. I contacted Cold Steel and I asked them, hey, are some of these things normal? Is there a reason behind why they're produced this way so that I could get their side of the story? 
and include it in the review. Now, I obviously have my own opinion about things, but sometimes there's a method behind the madness or a reason or a logical explanation to why things are done the way they are. The Makugi were a little bit large, the Ito's a little bit loose, there was paper wrapped around the Nikago, and really the blade is, is pretty dull. I can rub my hand on it and I'm not getting cut, and that's that's not great. Now, the reason I contacted Cold Steel wasn't to have them really do anything. I got the sword second hand. I made that very clear, and I'm not expecting anything, but what they offered was to have the sword sent to them, and they would sharp it, sharpen it free of charge. They mentioned that, hey, if it's if you're able to draw your hand across the sword and it's not sharp, then that's, that's not good, and that they would remedy that. So, at this point in the review, I'm going to kind of push pause, send the sword to Cold Steel, and reevaluate it when it comes back from them. The reason I think that this is probably a good idea is, one, I've had other swords from Cold Steel, and I would say that I have not noticed any of them be this dull before. This is one of the dull, this is dull like an Yaito is dull. Maybe marginally sharper than an Yaito. So, it's a worthwhile thing to have them remedy that, so I can give you a better idea of what type of sharpness you would expect from Cold Steel. Or at least if they provide this type of service without fee, what you can expect from them if you get it back from them. So this is the box I got back from Cold Steel, and it took about well, a little bit over two months, which in the grand scale of things is not a lot of time. There's some things I should probably note up front here about this box, and that is that, one, uh, I made it very clear that it was a secondhand blade. Cold Steel was under no legal obligation to do anything for me, and they did, dis despite of me saying it's, it's a secondhand piece. They may have done it because they saw the edge on it, and that was really the precursor to getting it sent over to, to be sharpened and remedied because that was obviously from the factory and not not cool but nevertheless it was really nice of them to do that they did not have to they were under no legal obligation to do so and they did anyway they stood behind the product which is a valuable thing the thing i will note that is a little less positive is even though they offered to warranty the item it was not the greatest communication experience in dealing with it now if you were to buy this from an authorized distributor i don't know if the experience would be anything different but i had to kind of hound them to get an eta i kept asking well about how long is it going to take i wasn't expecting it to be done in two months i would have been fine if it took six months but I was, I was looking for something in writing that said it would be done by this time i found from experience if you don't do that you kind of leave yourself open to disappointment in any regard i sent a lot of emails and i didn't get a great response back i started calling and eventually i got somebody to call me back and they said hey it's just easier if we send you a new sword now, this is not a bad thing. I don't want to act like I'm disappointed about getting a newer, better product back. But at the same time, the reason behind it was a little bit of a downer to me. What I, I wasn't able to get a confirmed, this is exactly what happened, but somebody over the phone alluded to some personnel changes, some busyness around the area, and that some of the pieces from my sword may have been lost, and it was just easier to send me a new one. Now, that's, that's not necessarily bad. They're, they made up for their mistake. If they lost something, they replaced it with a brand new one. But if it had any sentimental value to me or had some customization or something I had done to refine it, getting it replaced would not have replaced that. And it, losing stuff isn't, isn't the greatest thing. But they did make up for it. So they, I got a better product back. And I think that is the reason, though, admittedly, I cannot confirm that that is exactly what happened. Maybe it was just too much of a pain in the ass to sharpen and deal with so they... They sent it a uh, said, you know, fuck it, we're going to just give this Yahoo to a new one to stop bothering us. Anyway, the one I got back is in good order. Uh, it, it stays in the Saya, everything lines up. I, I've heard that some of the cold steel pieces come with scratches or blemishes or dings or pings or that there could be some sort of issue. Nothing uh, from this is really indicating that it's bad. Everything seems to fit the way it's supposed to. Every, the sharpness is obviously remedied. That was the main reason I sent it in. The, the other thing I will note, though, as well, is that I did not get a response back if some of the other issues are normal. I, I did ask repeatedly in emails, is it normal to have paper wrapped around the Nikago? Is loose Edo a common thing? Do you get dull edges frequently? Is this an issue that's happened before? And I wasn't able to get any response back as to if this was a common thing, a one-off issue, or if any of that stuff has happened before, or if it's normal or not. So I, I really can't explain it. What I can say though is that this one is sharper. My camera work is dodgy and shitty, but at least this one has an edge. So that much is good. Hooray. The next part that I'm going to do is actually just start over. I'm going to do all of the cutting and photos and yada yada again. So this part may seem repetitive, but it's, it's going to give the second sword a fair shot. And you can compare and contrast some of the photos from earlier to the one of the second piece. So here we go. 
Now this one is just the second sword I got, the new one directly from Cold Steel, and I'm going to try and contrast the other experience with this, but kind of judge this one on its own merits as well. So the first thing I'm going to note is that the Saya is clean, I like the feel of it in my hand, and it, it doesn't have any pings, nings, dicks, chips, fucks, fucking fucky fuckaroos, it's all in good shape. There is still a transition on the Kojiri, but that's not really a huge issue, and it's not really a huge transition. Uh, the thing I'm going to note though is that there's no nicks, it's overall a very good condition Saya, and I like the overall shape of it. Still hard to make out the buffalo horn area on the Koiguchi, but it's transitions really well between the Fuchi, and I, I like how this line comes up. It's big, but not overly done, so it's not a terrible contrast. Now, when I look at the Ito and the Saya and all of that, I, I just like how the lines work on the sword. The Suba, as well, has the same type of casting quality. Really, all of the fittings do on this. If I look at the casting on this one or the old one and compare the video, the casting is still very good, though presumably they were made at very different points in time. I can still make out a lot of the detail. I still like the contrast between the Sepa. I'm still getting the same types of, of colors, so this one, depending on the light, might look a little more silver, but it still has that goldish look to it. The Habaki fits reasonably well in the Saya. It still looks the same. I still wish it had a little bit more of an embellishment on it. But you can see that it's not over the Fuchi. It's sized reasonably well, and it holds and does its job as a, as a Habaki. The round side of the blade, you can see that the shaping is, is overall pretty good. I don't have any Suba wiggle. I don't have any Habaki wiggle. Everything is in good order the way it's supposed to be. Now the Ito is tighter, I can tell you that much about it. The shape of the Suk is a little different, but not drastically. Still, I like the, the feel of it, but there's no uh, really loose Ito. It could be tighter, I can move some of it around, uh, but it doesn't move around as much. The Kashra has a little bit of wiggle, but it's nothing overly pronounced, and nothing else is, is really loose, per se. The Ito could be tighter, but it's not terrible. I do notice as well that the one Minuki also lacks the same casting quality on just one of them, but for the most part I'm assuming that that's intentional and everything else is cast really well. There's a lot of detail that you can see. In terms of the blade, it's really the same type of blade. I, I think it's a little less cumbersome to wield than the other cold steel swords I've had, but in terms of just the aesthetics, the same polished bohi, the same kind of 800 grit-ish polish, the same kind of definition on the kasaki. No, nothing really bad. The bohi terminations line up correctly. There's no blemishes. Other, I mean, the, the polish is one big blemish, you might say. It's not a refined polish, but nothing stands out as scratched or fucked up or dinged or bad. There, there's no blemishes or sire rub that really show up as pronounced. I didn't get it with any rust or any nicks or any, any really thing bad to say. The Kasaki is also brushed on. It's reasonably well defined, I guess, but it's just brushed on. It's not geometric or anything like that. It doesn't have to be, but as an aesthetic addition, it, it's pretty much in the same shape as it was before, though I think that the Yakote on this one, the line definition between them, is a little bit better than the previous one, but not, not really much different at all. The other thing to point out is that the flats of the blade, this one is pretty much on par with the other one in that it's clean and good for what it is. Not perfect, but pretty good. As one additional note, I tried taking the Suka off to see what's going on with the Nakago to see if paper was still there, but I couldn't get the Makugi to budge. They're really soft and they, they're in there very firm, and I didn't want to risk breaking anything. I'd rather just have a sword that's functional, but taking it apart for cleaning is not a strong option. I used a nail set to try and take them out and, and really just nothing budged. All right, so now comes the real test with a sword that's actually sharp. And some things I'm going to note. Uh, one, I like that the Segeo is a little bit long on this one. So often swords come with a really short Segeo, but this one seems like it's long enough to actually work with. I'm just doing some very rudimentary business here while, while I'm doing some testing. Just to, to get a feel for things, I'm doing a quick knot in the Segeo just so it doesn't fall out. I'm noticing, though, that pretty much right away, one of the Shitadome are... are getting a little bit loose as I'm moving the Segeo around. They're not glued in, they're just kind of friction fit, and that is not necessarily a terrible or bad thing, it is pretty much what it is. But you can see that it comes out. A little dab of glue might solve the issue here, but if you do that, it's really, really cumbersome to try and get the Segeo back in there. I would like to see it if they were glued or maybe friction fit better, but 
there you go, they loosen up a little bit. To go on to the actual usage perspective of things, I'm just throwing the Segeo around me and I'll start doing a little bit of drawing. And what I'm noticing first off is that I really love the feel of the side in my hand. It doesn't feel overbuilt or clunky or huge. It has a little bit more refined shape. The sword, however, does not. I will admit that I like this more than the warrior or the dragonfly. Both of those swords gave me the feeling of a big dead crowbar in my hand. That may not be fair, and it's obviously been, well, not obviously, but it's been years since I've handled one of them, but I remember them feeling not great, and that was the reason I kind of got rid of them. This one feels better, but marginally so. It's still very hard for me to start moving and kind of cumbersome for me to stop moving in my hand. It she's and does no toe and all of that kind of stuff reasonably well. Again, I like the, the Saya quite a bit, but the blade itself is just not the most comfortable thing to move around. It, it comes out reasonably well, I, you know, it's, it's easy to do drawing and whatnot, but I don't, I just don't like the feel of the blade. It feels very cumbersome in my hand and, and quite a bit more dead than I've felt other swords. It, it, I wish, I'm trying to find something nice to say about it, and the only thing I can really find to say is that it feels better than other swords from Cold Steel, but it, it doesn't really have the same refinement that a lot of other pieces do. Maybe that's my internal bias, maybe that's because I just don't want to like it, but I have to say that it, it just feels kind of hard to move, and that's that's my main feeling from it, is it's not a very nimble, lively blade. It's not supposed to be though, I mean it's a big hardy chopper, but even for big hardy choppers there's a way to make those feel good in the hand, and this one this one doesn't give me that vibe. It doesn't give me a comfortable feeling in my hand as I'm moving it. So we've finally gotten to the portion of the review where I'm cutting stuff with an actual sharp cold steel sword. Finally, right? It's only been like 25 minutes. Anyway, the thing that I'm going to say about this is that it moves through targets now, but it has an edge, so that really shouldn't be terribly surprising. What I am going to say about the sword, though, is that it gives me a very similar impression that I had before I cut anything, and that is that it's heavy, it's hard for me to control, and, and maybe, again, that's just part of my bias, though, when I'm actually attempting to hit stuff and having difficulty getting it exactly where I want it, and I'm trying to stop it, and I'm trying to get it to have tip speed, and I'm having difficulty doing that, it makes me feel a little bit better about kind of having that opinion up front because it seems validated now. But again, I will reserve the fact that that may just, may just be me. It may just that it be that I don't want to like it. Anyway, it's cutting through bottles and it's cutting through cucumbers, so that's good. But to Tommy, it didn't, did not do so well. Now I'll compare this to another sword that I cut at the same time with. But uh, what I'm going to say is that it did cut through stuff. I had difficulty with some of the upward cuts, but I'm not using a stand with a screwed in peg. Uh, some of the downward cuts, the downward diagonal cuts worked, but I had to put a lot of oomph in it and it was difficult for me to generate tip speed and I'm having difficulty stopping the sword afterward. The thing that I will say kind of in defense of the sword or thing, something that's good is I whacked the sword into the stand a few times accidentally. Uh, I did give it a lot of gusto. There was no bends, there was no edge deformation, no edge rolling. Uh, nothing presented itself as a functional problem with the sword after using it for some degree of cutting and not really anything intensive. But at times I've had Hanwei swords that have dinged on this. The, the L6 piece from the Hanwei Oni Katana that I had dinged when I whacked it into the stand. I whacked this one into the stand and it didn't ding. It, granted, it's not supposed to ding. That's good. It should hold its shape after the basic cutting that I've done. I'm just saying that not everyone does. So the fact that it's straight and nothing is rattling and nothing is loose is a positive thing for the sword. Now just to compare and contrast a little bit, I'm going to harp on this for a while here. So. This is a Skydro Domo Katana that I got secondhand from someone on Facebook. And I want you to note that the tatami was the same batch of tatami. I cut them within moments of one another. This is the same batch of tatami, wetted for the same time, dried for the same time. Just a different sword, right? And what you can see is that I'm having drastically different results cutting with the Skydro Domo Katana than I did with the Cold Steel, cutting the same medium. I felt actually comfortable enough to take the Skydro Domo Katana to much thicker targets and I still had good results cutting with it. Now, rolled wet newspaper is a lot harder to cut than tatami, especially when it's six inches thick like this. And the Skydro Katana, I, I actually felt comfortable enough to take it to this type of cutting medium and I didn't with the cold steel. Here you can contrast me cutting side by side the cold steel versus the Skydro on the same medium. And the main point that I'd say is worth noting is that the Skydro just felt more nimble, easier to control. It was still a big heavy cutter, but 
just easier to work with and cut better. And that's kind of not because the Skydraw is overly special, but just because, in my opinion, the Cold Steel falls a little bit below average when it comes to usability. All right, I'm going to try and wrap this thing up, and it's really hard for me to do without ranting and rambling as I commonly do. I'm going to try to be concise about some of this stuff and eventually I'll get to the point where I tell you if I think it's worth it or not, but as I promised earlier I will elaborate a little bit on some of the drama surrounding the Cold Steel stuff and why it might influence your opinion. Now most of the time this is not important information or at least it's not something that comes up very publicly with other sword manufacturers. I have no idea what Paul Chen does in his spare time, but for some reason if Lynn Thompson shits on the toilet sideways it shows up in my Facebook feed. I'm not trying to tell you how to stand on any of the issues that I'm mentioning. I'm just saying that they're public information, they're points of contention, and they may influence how you spend your money. And it's another factor that you as a consumer are able to judge Cold Steel on because it is public information that you don't necessarily have with some of the other manufacturers. So uh, the first one, Cold Steel markets their products in a way that some people find distasteful, whether it be that they're chopping up carcasses of animals like pigs or cutting through rope or even... Some claims that might be a little hyperbole is the toughest or the best or something like that. To me, it just stands out as the average minutia marketing that anyone throws out. In fact, I kind of like that they actually show their product in motion, but that's just me. It's never been a point of contention for me, but I will say that some people are not too thrilled with the, the claims that they make or the way that they advertise the product. Uh, the next bit that seems to show up is Cold Steel's defense of their intellectual property. Some time ago, they patented the term San Mai, and they may have had some contentions with smaller knife manufacturers for use of that term. Now, San Mai means that you use sandwich steel. You have one type of carbon in the center and then uh, other layers of steel in the outer edge, or one type of steel in the middle, different types of... It's like a sandwich of steels. I'm not a knife smith, but that's my understanding of what San Mai means. It's a very old term used to describe the construction methodology for the type of knife or something. And Cold Steel patented it a long time ago and doesn't want other people to use it. It'd be like if Subway patented the term sandwich and they were like, we make sandwiches, fuck yeah. And then other people made sandwiches and they're like, we make sandwiches. And Subway was like, fuck you, don't say that. We patented sandwiches. But sandwich would be the best word to describe the sandwich that you're making. I, maybe my analogy falls short on a few different levels, probably many of them. I'm not a patent lawyer, but it sounds like the they patented the term. It's legal. We live in a society where you can patent the term orange juice and sandwich and San Mai. Anyway, it's it's kind of a douche move to some folks. Uh, I will say that uh, I have certainly an opinion on it. I don't, I don't really like it, but it is kind of the culture we live in. So that is another point of contention that comes up. The last bit is that, probably the most public, is that Lynn Thompson is an avid hunter. He put a press release I'll put a link to in the description below that said an open letter to hunters where he elaborates on a whole bunch of different things that involve hunting. I frankly didn't read it all, but he talks a little bit about some of the more controversial kills that he's made. One of them is a leopard. He's hunted exotic animals. Some people are very much against it. Some people are very for it. And there's two sides to the argument. I'm not trying to give you any kind of moral lessons or tell you what side you should be on. I'm just saying that that's public information and it may influence how you spend your money. Those are things that you can know about Cold Steel publicly that you might not know about other sword manufacturers. If they bother you, then don't spend your money. If you support them, then spend your money. And if you don't care, then I guess I'll move on to the next point. Here we go. So the, the last bit is, do I think it's worth it? And really, it should come as no surprise based on what you saw that my answer would be no. The reason for that isn't just the bias I mentioned earlier or some of the drama. If I judge the sword really on its own merits, at $450 there's a lot of options out there, as there are for just about every sword out there. But it seems like with this particular option there are other swords that really do the same thing for less money that I've had better luck with. If I think of the Hanwha Raptor that I reviewed or any of the Cold Steel Dojo Pro series blades that I reviewed, I got better cutting results, they felt better in my hand and they were less expensive. It's really tough for me to say that $450 is worth it or that I would spend my money on it when I can get something that does a better job for me for less money. That's really kind of where the answer comes from. Now, in defense, I will say that I don't think the sword's a ripoff. $450 isn't a little, but it's it's not a lot, I guess, on the grand scale of swords. If something about the sword uh, tickles your fancy in the way it looks, I don't see a problem with hanging it on your wall. It doesn't seem like a, a terrible ripoff. If it, if, I mean, it is a little different. It has some nickel silver fittings and they're well cast. Maybe you like that. Uh, maybe there's something about the balance or the heft or something that really sings to you. If you've held one in your hand before and it just gives you good positive vibes, 
I have that experience with my Hanway bamboo mat. I don't begrudge you for it. Then buy it. Doesn't doesn't seem bad. It held up to banging into the stand and whatnot, where some other swords have not. So I don't think it's a terrible ripoff. It just doesn't really do a lot for me. Didn't really like the way it handled. It felt difficult for me to control. I didn't have the best luck cutting with it. And in comparison, there are just other swords that I've had better luck with that are the same type of no hamon, kind of no frills very workhorse style blades and, and they work better for me. That's really where the answer comes from and I, I think that I can feel good about that despite the biases that I mentioned earlier. I think I'm, I'm founded or grounded at least in that opinion. But you let me know what you think. If you think I'm being a dickhole and being unfair, just toss some comments below. If you think I'm being fair enough, then I'd, I'd like to feel vindicated as well. But anyway, some folks asked me to do a review on Cold Steel stuff. I hope that this suffices. This blade is very similar to the Warriors, uh, the Warrior blade from Cold Steel as well as the Dragonfly one. So hopefully this helps you understand a little bit about how they perform. Uh, I hope you found it helpful. And as always, thank you for watching. Cheers.